Hi everyone, welcome to Life Edge, because life just shouldn't or have to be mediocre. I'm Rick Zanotti and I'm joined today by my good friend, Dr. Susan Nash. We haven't seen each other in six weeks. How are you, Susan? And Happy New Year, belated. Thank you. It's been so long, but it's been great. I'm glad to be here. I'm in the happy, chilly town of Tulsa and life is good. That sounds great. Well, today we have a great guest. He's back on, I think it's either third or fourth visit, Dr. Ed Stewart our favorite economist. Here we go. Hi, Rick. Hi, Hi Susan. <laughs> and we are back, and Dr. Ed is in that center position of power. Actually, there he is. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, good. Um, happy to be back on, um, back in the States. Um, as we talked about in the pre-show, I flew back from Ireland last Wednesday and had a lovely visit in the Emerald Isle and all kinds of interesting things going on. With, uh, now you, you took a student group there, right? No, I did. This was, this was a scouting trip. I was by myself. Ah. I'm, taking a student, I'm taking a student group in September, and actually, Rick, we're doing... Dublin, Belfast, and then Edinburgh. So we'll be in um, two countries and three different regions of what used to be the British Empire mm -hmm. and is being uh, reconfigured almost as we speak since we're on the cusp of Brexit. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Oh, I I wonder... Do you think it's going to happen? Tomorrow. Oh, yeah, it's, it's tomorrow. Yeah, it's, it's the... The British Parliament has approved it, and okay. um, today the EU Parliament signed off on the document. Hmm. Now, what has happened is they've signed um, this agreement, but um, they, there's one year to work out some of the details, hmm. and uh, the real issue is nobody knows what the details are. Oh, right? Great. So, <laughs> what the what the consequences of Brexit? will be and it, it's really um, interesting with regard to um, Ireland the Republic of Ireland the independent country and then the six counties of Northern Ireland and also uh, the region of, of Scotland because mm -hmm. there, there are elections that just happened in Britain and there are actually elections um, on February the 8th in the Republic of Ireland. Okay. So I was, one of the nice things about being in, in Dublin last week was I got to at least listen to and see a lot of the political debate that was going on among the various parties that are um, campaigning for seats in the, in the Republic Parliament. Hmm. Yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be real interesting. Uh, it's. And they may be the first of many others who leave. They're, from what I was reading, something like 20-something countries have already asked to leave. So we'll see if that goes. You know, it, it's sort of the, I think people like the economic part of it, but they don't like the control part of it. That's, that's from what you I've been reading. Right. Yeah. And well, like, actually, actually, you'll hear, hear other, go ahead, Susan, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say what's interesting is that in the last year, especially, people realize, okay, this is something that's going to happen. So, supply chains were just absolutely mapped out. And it turns out that it's turned out to be a big opportunity to build a lot of warehouses <laughs> in, in England. <laughs> so, yeah. like getting... <laughs> yeah. And also, there, there is some particular podcast, I'm going to be the official representative of the European Union. Um, but the, yeah, the consequences I think are going to be for England um, in terms of cutting themselves off from their major um, trading partner. And it'll be difficult for the Republic of Ireland uh, because one of the, one of the things I, I, I did, Rick and Susan, in, intentionally is because I'm going to take students to Dublin and then to Belfast. I took the train from Dublin to Belfast hmm. um, last uh, Monday, not this past Monday, but the Monday before, 
just to, first of all, see what it was like and to see um, what kind of border issues or, well, there were. And um, there were no border border issues. It was like going from California to Oregon. You, hmm. Unless you knew what the town was, there was no, I had my passport with me just in case. There was no border issue whatsoever. That's one of the things they have not decided is what kind of border there's going to be between the Republic of Ireland mm. and Northern Ireland. And at the same time, they have to kind of decide what kind of border, in quotes, between the island of Ireland and the island of, of Britain. Because if there's mm. no border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, then there might have to be a border between Eng the, the British Isle uh, and the island of Ireland because one of the things that the UK will need is some kind of border between it and the now European Union. What kind of customs, what kinds of passport checks, mm -hmm. all of that kind of thing. So that's still um, to be worked out. And, there's, and, and if anybody tells you, Rick, that they know what's going to happen, then you shouldn't believe anything else they say right. because nobody knows what's going to happen. Well, and the, the um, implications for the retirees, for example, in, in Spain, there are a lot of English uh -huh. who retire. They go, yeah, yeah. yeah, I get to get to oh, Spain. Interesting. And they go there, and they, they've they been using the EU health uh, yeah. system. Mm. Right. Never right. can't. Or they're that's trying a, to work that, out that's a, a That's a really important point, Susan. The, and the other important point is there there are about 3 million residents in the United Kingdom who were married to citizens of the European Union. So you'll mm. have a British man and a French woman or a Spanish man and a British woman. And what is their citizenship going to be? What are their residency rights going to be? What are their um, options as far, like you said, Susan, of health care and voting and all of those kinds of and again, none of that has been worked out. Super and, complicated. And if they're, yeah, and if they're working, you know, what kind of, of uh, are they going to be considered guest workers? Are they going to be considered hmm. foreign workers on some kind of visa that only have a limited amount of time to be in Britain? Or, or can they be there permanently? And the part of the big campaign for the leave people in Britain was, oh, we're going to stop all of these immigrants from coming to Britain. Well, like most places, like most high-income countries, Britain is in desperate need of immigrants for all kinds of things, not just for carpenters and the Polish plumber, but for radiologists and, and mm -hmm. anesthesiologists and uh, Absolutely. construction Doctors. engineers. Yes, Doctors. all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and so that, that's all up in the air as, as well. The interesting thing is that in the Irish, I, I, I said that um, there's a parliamentary election in the Republic of Ireland um, next Saturday on February the 8th. It's also uh, interesting because it's the, the, the Irish prime minister, or the Taysuch, as he's called, Leo Varadkar, uh, called the election and got the Irish Parliament to put it on a Saturday. Hmm. The first time it's been on a weekend, and with the express purpose of increasing turnout. So that's why the election is on um, Saturday, February the 8th, is that this is an experiment to see whether they're, uh, they have a, a higher turnout. Um, one of the things about the Irish campaign is that Ireland I may be the only country that doesn't have a leave party in the EU, and none of the parties mention anything about leaving the EU, because hmm. for all of the EU's failures and troubles, Ireland is, is maybe exhibit A as to the, the benefits of the, of the EU and the benefits of the euro, um, because Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, now has a higher per capita income than the UK. Well, actually, so also, instead Ireland. Of the, in, instead of the poor Irish immigrants leaving um, the Emerald Isle to go to England or to come to the U.S., there actually may be uh, one of the things that may happen because of Brexit is that immigrants will leave the U.K. and move to Ireland. 
Because hmm. the, the Irish, if I recall correctly, wanted to be in the UK. And I'm sorry, in 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 the U. What am I saying? The, the EU. EU. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. remember they Very they strong. actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very it strong sentiment. It benefited yeah. them. And the, and the other part of the UK, and actually Northern in the in the recent in the December of 2019 UK parliamentary election that gave. Boris Johnson, his his majority mm -hmm. uh, in the in the parliament, um, his majority of the Conservative Party came from England. Right now, one of the things I always have to explain to my students in my European economics courses is that England and the UK are not the same thing, and you you'll get very right. um, <laughs> yep you'll get you get you'll get very uh, angry responses if you're in Edinburgh and refer to somebody as English, <laughs> or you're in Wales and refer yep. to somebody as yeah, well, and don't you, th you think Scotsit will be next? Yes, that was where I'm going, Susan. You you read my you read my mind, right? That the the parliamentary election, uh, the British parliamentary election, the U excuse me, the UK parliamentary election, the the lead party in Northern Ireland was a nationalist party, Sinn Fein. Um, the lead party in Scotland that won, I, I wrote the numbers down, Susan, so I'd have it. 48 out of the 59 MPs of, from Scotland in the December election are uh, members of the Scottish National Party, who, hmm. um, after, the, after this Brexit thing, th there'll be another um, independence referendum in Scotland. Um, and hmm. one of the things I facetiously tell my students, Rick, is that when Scotland secedes from the, from the European Union, um, they might choose to become a constitutional monarchy and if they choose to be a constitutional monarchy, the last royal house in Scotland were the Stuarts. And so I have my resume ready to apply for that job. <laughs> I just need a small uh, palace in downtown Edinburgh and a, and a, and a, a castle in the Highlands near. Uh, they can pick whichever Scottish uh, whiskey distillery I'm near, but that, that'll be fine. Ed, 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 if you get elected, I will send you, and I have one, my William Wallace sword. Okay, excellent. <laughs> oh, good. I yeah, will send you that. that. May be, actually, maybe I'll use that for my campaign post. That would be will, perfect. You know, yep. on, yes, yes. It's a really cool, it's a so, real one. It's it's big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to, to follow on Susan, to be not so facetious and follow on Susan's serious question, that it could be within five or ten years, hmm. um, the only the only part of the UK that's not in the EU will be England and Wales, and Scotland oh. will be in the EU as an independent country, and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland will be <laughs> one country. In fact, one of the Irish uh, parties in the Republic of Ireland, Sinn Féin, the strongly nationalist party, one of its platforms for this coming election is that they want a unity referendum by 2025. Hmm. That uh, they want a referendum in both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland on whether the, those two political entities should unify. And hmm. right now, the betting, my betting would be that the people in Northern Ireland, although they are somewhat different, um, and they have a slightly different culture, slightly different religious um, focus or majority. But it may be the case that they have to choose between two two evils, right? The evil yeah. of of being in the in the UK and not being in the EU, or un uniting <laughs> with their um, evil Catholic cousins in the South, but being in the in the EU. Um, and my guess is that the referendum would probably be something like 53 for unification with the Republic and 47 against, something mm. like that. Pretty close. So isn't yeah. Gibraltar so, also part of the UK? Yes. Yeah. And so, that's yes, another, that's me. really, that's a really good, another question is what that, what that little rock at the <laughs> tip of <laughs> Spain is going to do. <laughs> and there may be a, there may now be, have to be a hard border between the um, kingdom of Spain and the and the island of uh, Gibraltar. Hmm. And that's so strategic. Yeah. I mean, militarily yeah. strategic. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's they, another thing, Rick, is that the EU isn't a military, uh, whatever, a, a, a military alliance, and mm -hmm. the UK is a permanent member of the UN, one of the key pillars of NATO, along right. with France and, 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 and Germany. So they'll be, the UK will be out of the EU, but they'll still be in tightly NATO. bound yep. in, in, in NATO, right? Now, what do you think that the odds are? I've been reading. You'll some have to get rid of Gibraltar to get rid of some of the um, mm -hmm. the hordes of immigrants from from um, Africa because mm. <laughs> cause they're still their back door in. Yeah, yeah. No, and so the whole idea of what or the whole concept of what's going to be the border and where it's going to be and is it going to be? You have you have this new phrase, hard border and soft border mm. that you hear. Right. right. And and what's the operational definition of that? And again, that's not been worked out now now ed i've been reading some some of the futurologists i don't know them by name but some of the theories they have are and we're sort of getting that way anyway in the world we've got the north american alliance that may happen or may change with canada the u.s mexico uh -huh. and maybe some other central american countries plus maybe the islands in the caribbean i don't know maybe right. that that's a, we kind of have it anyway just not quite uh -huh. the way they're thinking and there's a lot of, I, I don't know if it's 50-50, but there's a lot of w dissent between the futurologists of, will the EU survive? A lot of people say no. A lot of people say uh -huh. yes. Some people think it'll survive as a trading organization, which is what they've been trying to do for about 40, 50 years. And others say that the cultures are going to really be in the way and that they won't survive because of that. Well, what's what's uh -huh. your take on that? Because the e EU has helped monetarily right. a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it's controversial now, Rick. Um, you, you raise an excellent point. It's it's been attacked from kind of the, what you might call the right or conservatives mm -hmm. about what you said too bureaucratic, uh, too overbearing. But but recently, especially after the the problems in in Greece and Italy and so forth is yeah. now being attacked from the left as being much too worried about um, inflation and monetary mm -hmm. stability and <clears throat> budget balances and things like that. So um, we may have to have 40 or 50 more podcasts on what's going on with the EU and, and um, yeah, like you said, there may be other people, other peoples Here. leaving. Um, there also there's a there's a whole list of candidates that still want to get in. Mainly, yeah. the other re constituent Turkey. republic of, of what was um, actually what was Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, the Serbs, the North Macedon now it's called North Macedonia, yep. uh, Albania, uh, uh, Bosnia. Slovenia is uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, is right. Part of the I, did, I did. I I actually, Susan, uh, have you been to Ljubljana? Have you been to Slovenia? Yes, yeah, several times. Ah, I I took my students there a couple of years ago, and uh, one of the things I said to them after we'd been there three days is we've been here much longer than the president has been there <laughs> in the home country of his wife. Right? Uh, I think he was in Ljubljana for yeah. two hours. He flew in and flew out. Uh, but yeah, uh, Slovenia is not only in the EU. But they were one of the more rapid adopters of the euro. So not only are they yes. in the EU, but they're also um, the euro. Whereas Croatia, which is in the EU also, still has their funny little currency, the kuna, mm -hmm. which is a, some kind of an animal that looks like a mink. And the, and the reason it's the currency is that the pelts of that little animal uh, were currency, were mm. in trading. Right? Yep. It's one of those things oh, cool. that, that professors do to yeah. Yeah. Try to keep their students I was there interested in foreign exchange theory. Pardon? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I was, yeah. I, the, the Slovenian, when I was there first. Before. When it was the, uh, ah, I okay, you were there before I was. Yeah. yeah. Actually, actually <laughs> Ed, we, we interviewed one of the ambassadors of Slovenia on the show about, what, three years ago? Oh, terrific. Yeah. 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 He was really, very yeah, interesting. Really, uh, a very progressive country, a very, uh, you'll like mm -hmm. this, Rick, uh, the current prime minister, one of the books he wrote was Democracy for Children. And Interesting. And I thought, what a good book to give to Congress and to yeah. uh, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> presidents and city councils in Chicago yeah. and so forth. That, yeah. Yes. Would you uh, say? Yeah. Quite. W- now, would you say ahead. that for years I've I've said there are no real democracies anywhere in the world because you need an enlightened population to have a true democracy. You know, we have republics mm-hmm. in this, and some claim. Actually, it's funny because you know the only ones who claim to be democracy are the communist states, which are which are hilarious. But you know, yeah. do you do you think we have anything close to a real democracy anywhere? Because there's a lot of little countries that maybe are closer. I'm not sure, but we yeah, don't. The, little, not, yeah. the first yeah. things that come to mind, Rick, are what you just said: the little countries, yeah. some places like Iceland, and yeah. mm-hmm. I think I think the Netherlands may be a democracy. Denmark. Okay. Where, they, where you get people that 80 to 90 percent of the population votes okay. um, and are active in some kind of political party. Now, mm-hmm. there are five or six or seven or eight political parties, so everybody um, participates. Yeah. And also, I think one of the things that um, makes it, at least me as an economist, think that in the United States we're moving away from a democracy is mm-hmm. what I now call the Michael Bloomberg effect. And mm. to have political power, you need to be a billionaire, right? That, yeah, it's kind uh, of a shame. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't have a we don't have a, a monarchy here. We we we're not quite an oligarchy, probably a corporocracy, maybe. Uh, yeah. That's an excellent word. Yeah, exactly. I think. Yeah. You, did you coin that word? I'm I don't know. I, I was thinking there must be something right? like corporocracy. I wasn't sure, um, but that's kind of what Never we have. We have. Headed. You never okay. Yes. Well, can we patent it? Let's patent it on the show. We three yeah, have created you, that I word. Yeah, right. Uh, we now demand royalty. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, so okay. Oh, this is just off the wall. And, and Rick, please, if you go back to whatever you were talking. <laughs> but I, but I, I, I don't know why this intrusive thought. But I wanted to ask you what you think the economic impact of of pandemic would be, or the economic impact at least. First, and the coronavirus in China and for China, and, and then, I mean, just, and then the e- economic impact of pandemic. It's one, of, it's one of those things, and actually, I'll bring it back to the European Union and and one of the costs of Brexit is, pandemics happen now much more frequently because of globalization. Mm-hmm. Right? There are <coughs> costs and benefits to globalization. The benefits for globalization are. The computer I'm using and the cell phone I have are much, much cheaper, and the running shoes I, I use are much, much cheaper than they would be if there if there wasn't globalization. Mm-hmm. The the costs of it are that things like recessions and panics and diseases move much more quickly, um, and especially in, in a country like China. Um, I'm going to bring it back to self-interest. Uh, the only stock I own myself that's not in some kind of a pension plan or something is Starbucks. And because I go there every day and I wanted some reason to feel good about paying ridiculous amounts of money for <laughs> cups of coffee that when I <laughs> when I was at the University of Oklahoma, you would go to Oklahoma Union and get coffee uh, in the in the little hodls, right? The little bottles for, you know, 20 cents. Um, but Starbucks has shut down already 2,000 of their 5,000 um, stores in, in China. And a company, for example, like General Is that Motors. Is that, that's, was yeah, that recent? the last couple of days. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And then um, the automobile industry, there are, um, I think I've, I've said this before on the on the, this uh, Life Edge podcast, Rick. But when I was in in Beijing, the three or four times I've been in Beijing, and gotten nearly run over on the street, a, a lot of times it was by Buicks and uh, uh, Fords. But they weren't Buicks or Fords. They weren't made in Detroit. They were made in China. But some of the components come from General Motors and Ford factories all over the all over the world. And and so you shut down or, or block off the the Chinese economy and it's it's a big part of the of, of the global economy and it's gonna hurt everybody all over the place. Right? They said well, one of the I, main I, Go ahead, Susan. Oh okay, I was just gonna say, I mean I, I was there in October in Tianjin uh-huh. and 
changing. And I mean, it, it changed a lot just in the since the two years before, and I just couldn't believe it. And then um, you're right about the 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 economy is really vibrant, and they've been pushing consumption, internal uh -huh. consumption, to keep their to keep their economy going to avoid problems with any kind of trade wars. So right. you think about people are and trapped in their apartment. Part of that consumption or our venti uh, peppermint frappuccinos and uh, yeah, but I'm, no. I mean, and automo automobiles and, and housing and so forth. Yeah. Well, they were saying yeah, that so, now, so they won't be able to purchase. They're trapped in their homes. Right. Now, now Susan, exactly. going back to your pandemic idea or question, yes. what I've been reading is if there were a pandemic that actually really did spread uh, something like the Spanish flu or whatever it was back in the early 1900s, uh -huh. that what would be hit first would be jobs because uh -huh. there would be a lot of issues with people being either quarantined or going to work or not. They were saying jobs would be hit quickly. Airlines would be hit very quickly because they would freeze flights everywhere, even though that usually right. would probably be too late. Um, uh -huh. and, and the other thing is, you know, there's the fear factor more than anything else. People are afraid of what they don't understand. So right. the coronavirus, while it could be a bad virus or whatever, it could affect one person could get three or four people infected but they also said that it's not that strong in most cases as right. compared to if you're healthy or your immune system's good there's a chance not much will happen but they don't tell I you that know. on the news they just want to scare you uh, well and are they doing more harm than good by sure. being so extreme sure that's the news Actually, that's what there was they, a, there was a, <laughs> yeah there was a press conference today by the world health organization hmm. and the director general said that um, they advise strongly against um, flight restrictions or travel mm -hmm. restrictions that they must have been listening to you, Rick, because he said um, the, the, there is a, a, a problem in, in China, but there's um, in terms of what people die from in the U.S., uh, die from ordinary flu, you know, thousands and thousands of people, much more serious than this coronavirus, yeah. which nobody has died from in the U.S. yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, there may be some fatalities, but there aren't any any yet. Um, and so, yes, unfortunately, we get, um, you know, if it bleeds, it leads or mm -hmm. fire on. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I just think that, that creating economic illness and malaise mm -hmm. has a, a much, I mean, just deliberately the, the creating a, a, an economic malaise will ha result in more deaths than the, than the virus itself. It probably, could. yeah. I think, I think, Susan, there's probably a PhD dissertation there. I, I'm, hmm. I'm in, the, in my little pea brain, I'm looking at the equations and how you build, right. Uh, because one of the things that happens in recession is that, um, mortality and and uh, morbidity uh, go up people get sick and people die in greater mm -hmm. numbers than in in uh, more prosperous economic um, times so yeah and and, yeah. and you know what's funny what a lot of those numbers don't show is the amount of depression suicides and everything else right. which go up right. high really high when yeah. those the economies just collapse and you know they don't talk about that very much because it doesn't look good on paper but and I don't even know if people are tracking that kind of information. Maybe maybe they are indirectly by saying, well, you know, mortality went down or went up during a major depression or hyperinflation or whatever. But they may not relate that to the to the economy or anything else, but it could be directly tied to it, that emotional factor. Sort of like in the old days we measured IQ, but we didn't measure EQ or the emotional intelligence. Uh -huh. You know, that has a lot to do with how crazy we are in, in a lot of ways. Um, right. Hey, Ed, just out of curiosity, I, I, I've had a theory for a long time that China is probably, well, it's been talked about, it's not my theory, but that they're, they're really kind of a scary economy. They're, they're not a strong economy. If America stops buying, they die, period. We are the biggest consumers in the world, bar none. But the other thing is, the military is now kind of ticked off at, you know, great supreme leader who's now leader for life. 
Uh, uh-huh. So they're, again, bordering on there may be other political problems there. There may be a coup. Who knows? Anything's possible. The people don't love the government. They just have to shut up about it. I, I don't think the Chinese government as is will last more than 10 more years. I think between the world as it is and the internet and everything else, things will change. I don't think a, a dictator for life is going to be able to do it in this day and age. Maybe. Maybe. What, what do you think about that? Um, I would I would disagree with most of that, except okay. I would be less prone to disagree uh, these days because of Hong Kong. And mm. I think the Hong Kong issue scares the, the Jesus, to yep. use a scientific term, yep. <laughs> out of the, the regime in, in Beijing. Because um, one of the things that happens as, as people get wealthier, one of the things we talk about in economics are what are normal goods, inferior goods, and what are luxury goods, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, inferior goods actually came out of a study of Irish uh, dietary habits. Mm. And the potato is a is the classic example of an inferior good. When Irish incomes go down, Irish consumers buy more potatoes because they can't afford beef and chicken and lamb. And when their incomes go up, they buy less potatoes. Um, because it's one of those things where normally you think, if you have more money, I'm going to buy more of X and Y and Z, but it's not necessarily um, true. So one of the things that's a luxury good in in a certain sense is democracy. So once you have a nice house and you're pretty well clothed and um, you're you're well fed and you're educated, because one of the things that one of the successes of both Soviet communism and Chinese communism is that they have produced an educated population. Now, we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to adopt that model in things like economics and philosophy and political science and ethics and so forth. But in terms of, we were talking before the show about um, math and and science and so forth. The things that the Irish nuns beat into you Mm -hmm. and me, they've they've done an, an amazing, amazing job. Um, so the reason that there's political protest first in Hong Kong is that's, that's where the rich Chinese are. Mm -hmm. And, but there will be more Tiananmen squares in, in Beijing and Guangzhou and Shanghai, uh, when, I don't know. Um, I was, we did talk about this on the last kind of goes into what you just said. The same thing's going on in Russia. Uh, mm-hmm. but it's not going on in the periphery like Hong Kong is to Beijing. It's going on in Moscow. Um, and um, Susan's friend, Mr. Putin, right? He has just, in the last couple of weeks, uh, changed the Constitution, <laughs> dumped his government, and yep. is in uh, his uh, reign for life after his constant, mm-hmm. at least if follow the current Russian constitution, he has to leave office in 2024. Mm-hmm. But uh, as we would say in Oklahoma, he ain't going nowhere. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and so he has to, he's, he's in the process of changing the laws and will be around maybe beyond 2024, but that's an unstable situation um, also. And, so, he's, and he's young enough to last a long time still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he seems to be in pretty good shape. Yeah. Not as good in shape as the videos he produces, but, uh, well, well, but yeah. I'd like to jump in here and another... mention something. Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to mention something about, I, I meant to say it earlier. So so you're mentioning the impact of, of the trade war or whatever, and, and the last two years, I mean, I really admire the planners of, and the Chinese economy and what they're doing, and, and I like my the Belt Initiative and infrastructure, et cetera. So I think you know they've done a lot more to create linkages throughout the world. And then yes, in terms they've of they've done a very good job with their economy, much better, much and then, better than the Russian. Yeah, and then the other thing too is that they've managed to to um, stimulate consumption, like Rick was mentioning, if the if the U.S. consumers stop buying. Uh, Chinese goods, they're, they're toast. But now Chinese have enough savings and they have a high uh, marginal propensity to save that they uh-huh. are purchasing 
Ch by Chinese. They have this mm -hmm. like, concept. And that's that's actually helping, and they're putting and not just exporting all the the, the high quality things. They're keeping them in the country too. So that that's, was one that, of their. That's strategies. true. The the only risk they have there is if the yuan drops in value, they're kind of dead again. Yeah, um, I I, well, I think I would possibly. agree with 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 Rick that that it's a it's a shaky uh, society. I, I think yeah. it's, it's less shaky in terms of economics. I think it's more shaky in terms of politics and and um, uh, movements for democracy among among younger people. I mean, that's yeah. what's going on in Russia. It's what's going on in China. I think I think the older generation in China is quite proud to be Chinese because they're not um, under the thumb of the Japanese or the British mm -hmm. or the Americans or whatever. Yeah. They're you know kind of they're they can strut their stuff. Um, the and and this is one of the things, Rick, where I'm one of the really bad things that the Trump administration, although it's not just the Trump administration. It's limiting the number of Chinese students. Right. That, that I think you want you want Chinese students to come here to experience. Yes, mm -hmm. we have an imperfect democracy, but it's much more. It's much less imperfect than Chinese democracy, um, and I think that's our best. Uh, I don't want to use the word web. That's our best approach. That's our best program Influencer. for having a, an influence. Right. Thank you, Susan. Our best influence. Uh, on positive social and political change in in China and and in in Russia uh, too, but especially in in China. And the other thing, speaking purely as a professor who depends on income from universities, for a lot of universities, and it's probably more true in California than anything else, it's Chinese students that are paying the freight. Oh sure. That yeah. The only reason oh, California yeah. public tuition isn't isn't higher than it is. Is their, you know, Ma and Pa in Shanghai are sending their mm -hmm. little uh, Jing Zhu to Berkeley and UCLA and, yeah. and Davis and so forth, and paying ridiculously expensive out yeah. of country tuition, right. so that mm -hmm. I don't know what typical names would be in California, but in Oklahoma it'd be Billy Joe and Bobby Sue, and yeah. go to public college <laughs> and, and not and yeah. not pay much higher tuition than they would have to. No, and we call we call the oh, UC system true. here University of China at Berkeley, University of China yeah, at Los yeah. Angeles, because that's really for a while it was extremely Chinese, and and right. and granted they deserve to be in there. They had good grades. They were doing well. Right. Uh, to a certain point, they were paying a lot more, like you said, because they right. were out of state students. But um, you're right, and and it has helped in the way in in the engineering schools and the sciences. Yeah. They're very good right. students. They're very they're very sharp yeah. at that and. Um, you're right. California has a lot of immigrants that come in f doing that. So it, it, it is interesting. And, uh, it, you know, we're in an interesting world right now. You know, science fiction writers are probably having a blast with our world. It's like, well, we could do all sorts of stuff right now. But anyway, you know what? We are out of time. And, and as always, Ed, we, we so appreciate you coming on and sharing. And, you know, more economists should do what you're doing, taking students around the world, different parts. And really, until you've traveled, you don't have a clue what's going on here. I know Susan's traveled extensively, and I think it just changes you. It makes you, I think, a much, one, a better person, too, a much more open-minded person. And you understand the little balances of all these economies and systems and how they interact with each other. And it's scary. You probably have nightmares at night sometimes, but <laughs> it's a great I'm thing. Not, yeah. Yeah. Now, we appreciate you. And... To all those what watching, a well, conversation today. Thank you. Yeah, it was a yeah. We can, I think we could go on for a couple more hours. Oh, I, we could. Uh, we could. I was, in, I was in Tulsa over over the Christmas holidays because I drove down to Texas, so I stopped to see mm. some friends in, in Tulsa and and uh, I taken to one really really what? nice Mexican restaurant where there's a big skull in the in the foyer. So yeah, um, oh, yeah. Great. So we could we could. I think Rick, we should do one of these podcasts. I don't know that I forgot the name of the restaurant, but we could do it there and then just broadcast from uh, a nice Mexican restaurant in Tulsa, and that way uh, that would be and, fun. And go for two or three hours. Really yeah, fun. I think that would actually be fun. We have to do a was show one day. We have to we have to go on the road. Was it, was it yeah. Chimis? Was the restaurant Chimis? I, I, 
I could have been. I don't. I have no idea. My, my friend John, who's in the oil business and who graciously paid, because I'm just a poor professor and he's a Tulsa oil man, so he he paid and he just he picked me up at the at the Double Tree and and mm -hmm. in his big fancy uh, SUV and drove me there and uh, drove me back and paid the bill. So nice. I love Tulsa. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds good. Well, Ed, we look forward to having you on again soon and, and keeping this up because these are great conversations. They're a lot of fun. And uh, one of these days, we'll all get to meet you in person. That'll be fun, too. Um, oh, if, you, if you're watching the show, we have Ed's information below so you can go take a look and take some of his classes. He's got some interesting courses um, on the Great Courses Plus. And I think you're on the Great Courses and the Great Courses Plus, both of them. Right. And uh, good stuff. It's very good stuff. Your, your introduction to economics, and, and it, it's excellent. I really enjoyed it. And, and well, cultural systems. You also talk about communism versus capitalism. The, the, it was very good. That's a, that's a great class. And, you know, I knew a lot about capitalism, but I didn't know that much about the communist system in terms of economics. I learned a lot from that. So that was really, really good. And... Susan, you're back for a little bit, then you're traveling again. But hey, as long as you're back, we, we try to get a hold of her and bring her in. So, uh, thank you. Susan's busy, but anyway, we look well, forward I'm to seeing. Not much traveling this year. You're doing more traveling? No, less. Less. Okay. You know, she tells me that, and she winds up in Argentina or Mexico every other week. It's like, <laughs> how do you do this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, but we'll see you guys all next week. Uh, give us your feedback, get a hold of people, and have a great one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.